And that's challenge. Part of persuasion is a challenge. All of us respond to challenge. And a big challenge is you go do it, you go do it. Why don't you do it? You can do it. Here's a better challenge. Let's do it. Let's climb the mountain. Let's build a business. Let's start and get going. Let's become healthy. Not you go exercise. Let's exercise. Let's go to the gym. Let's jog around the block. Let's change our diet and see how healthy we can become. Let's, let's, let's. There's nothing more powerful than let's. Here's why. An ancient script says this. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Try that on for size. All of my enterprises for the last 40 years have been partnerships. Two, three, four people. Two, three, four. Why? Because it's so powerful. You say, well, isn't partnership tricky? Say, yes, it's tricky, but it's powerful. It's like marriage. It's tricky, but it's powerful. There's nothing like it. Having children, isn't that a little tricky? Say, yes, but you got to go for it. You got to try the experience. Having a child is like a throw of the genetic dice. And you have no idea what's coming up. How many previous generations in the throw? Who knows how many generations? But you, you got you to gotta play the game to see what? See if you can manage it. See if you can handle it. See if you can turn what is into what you wish to be. See if you can't influence and speak and use yourself as an influence over whatever happens and see if you can make something unique out of it. Sure, it's a challenge. Sure, it's a win or lose. But what else is new? Sure, the, the possibilities. But the odds are in your favor. Let's go do it. Old Testament says, one person becomes so powerful they can put a thousand to flight. If two get together, they can put 10,000 to flight. Here's what that suggests. Two getting together multiplies the power by 10, not by two. Why not try that? Why not take a gamble and see if it might not work for you? Get somebody and say, hey, let's go, let's go. Two of us and three of us, and nobody's a match for three of us. That's powerful stuff. Yes, it's tricky. Yes, it's part of the dynamics of, you know, the mysteries of life. But who knows, who knows, but who knows when it'll work? That's how we build cities, and that's how we conquer disease, and, and that's how we build universities, and that's how we build enterprise, and that's how we affect the world, two or three. How many pilgrims were there? It wasn't a million. How many did the little boat hold? Not very many. But they started something that has startled the world. The pilgrims. Not a million. Just a handful. Set out across the ocean. Let's see what we can do. Build a new country. Those dynamics are so powerful, they're irresistible. When somebody gathers you up and says, come on, let's go. Because you can't think of everything to be inspired. When somebody comes, let's go, let's try it, let's do it, let's do it, here we go. See, that is, that is so powerful that when the invitation is given, if it's the right invitation, you got to go. Or you put it together. Pick this one, pick this one, and say, let's go. Just two or three. How many disciples were there? Not 12,000. How many? 12, just, just 12, just 12, just two or three, just five or six, just a few can turn the world upside down, do extraordinary things. So remember this challenge, the we, let's go do it. The great prayer is a collective prayer. It doesn't say my father who's in heaven. No, it doesn't say that. It says what? Our father. Every time you pray, you might pray as an individual, but you pray collectively for the collective. Our father our family's father, our community's father, our country's father. Pray individually, yes, but pray the hour because it's, the, it's all of us that's, that's powerful. Each of us need all of us. All of us need each of us. Who's a match for all of us? <laughs> Nobody. Who's a match for one of us? Everybody. But all of us? Give me my daily bread. No. No. Yes, you pray it individually, but it's inclusive. Give us. Lead us around temptation. Deliver us. Individually prayed, but collectively thought about. Deliver us the family. Deliver us the community. Deliver us the organization. 
Here's the last part on communication, especially in the art of persuasion, and that's a passionate belief in something. And your passionate belief in something doesn't have to be something you talk about all the time. For some, it's religion, it's a unique experience, it's spiritual. For some, it, it is an objective, it is a, a vocation. But the greatest passion to start with is to be extremely successful and affect as many people as you can. That's, that's the quickest and easiest passion to uncover. And you don't have to wait till you find your passion. Just be passionate about being healthy. Be passionate about being influential. Be passionate about being extremely successful. Sinatra said, the greatest revenge is massive success. Be passionate about winning. You know, the game of financial independence, power, parenting, the best. Success is that early passion. To succeed in making progress, to succeed in getting healthy, to succeed in learning skills, to succeed in, in being better this year than you were last year, to succeed in expanding your horizons, to succeed, that's the early passion. Now, if you find something in particular like being a sculptor, you know, learning sculpturing or painting or whatever, and then that becomes, you know, a, a passionate affair with you, uh, that's fine. But the early passion can be just very simple A, B, C stuff, overcoming fears that you had, you know, being a more confident person, right? Self-esteem at the highest possible level, you know, that kind of passion to be an articulate person to be able to persuade, to be able to share my story, to be able to affect other people in a positive way, my community. You know, that's the passion, to take whatever you've got and turn it into a successful, prospering, flourishing, exciting, financial, social, personal, spiritual life. Right, that's the passion. To be all that you can possibly be. That was Mr. Schultz's philosophy. I said, how much should I earn? He said, as much as you can. How far should I go? As far as you can, how many books should I read? As many as you can, how much should I share? As much as you can. How many things should I try to go see? As many things as you possibly can. Stretch as far as you can, go as far as you can. Earn as much as you can, do as much as you can. Become as successful as you possibly can. Be the best parent you possibly can be. That was enough passion for me. In fact, it had so many unique categories that it's kept me busy all these years. Just trying to stretch to that degree. A passionate belief, a passionate persuasion about life. For some people it is a spiritual experience and they don't necessarily talk about it all the time, but they use it as fuel for the fire. It makes them unusual, it gives them charisma. It gives them an unusual presence. Not something they speak about all the time, but something that happens to them all the time. If you've ever been rescued, somebody saved your life, I'm sure that would be an experience that would linger and fuel the fire for how long? Probably forever. Someone saved your life. That's, you just, then you just use that experience. You don't necessarily talk about it all the time. You just use it. You know, I got a second chance at life. I mean, it could have been over for me. I got the second chance. Now that I got this second chance, I'm going to make it everything I can possibly make it. And those fires burn. Right? You use it, you use it. And whether it's religion or whether it's spiritual or whether it's a personal or whether it's social, whatever it is, just, just use that to become a, a, a great persuader. The greatest, in my opinion, of the apostles was the, the great persuader. He found himself in a prison one day, the king's prison, Agrippa. And Agrippa said, you know, I've heard about this unusual man that's head of the Christian movement. Bring him to me. And they said, yes, he's in your jail. And Agrippa said, I got to meet the man. So they hauled him out of jail, out of the prison, and brought him to Agrippa. And Agrippa said, Paul, I've heard about you. What is this Christian thing? Unfortunately, you find yourself in my jail, but what's going on here? It's grown like a prairie fire. What's the deal? Well, he shouldn't have asked. <laughs> I mean, right fresh out of the prison, the apostle said, let me tell you my story, King. He said, I used to hate the Christians, killed everyone I could get my hands on. In fact, I had letters from your own government to kill every Christian I could find. 
And he said, one day I had some of these fresh letters in my hand and I'm on my way to Damascus to kill more Christians. Agrippa said, wow. But he said, on this trip, this great light shined out of heaven, knocked me off my horse, ground my face in the dirt, and blinded me for three days. Good Lord just wanting to get his attention. And he said, from this unique experience, I became a Christian. Now they call me Paul. I was formerly known as Saul, the persecutor of the Christians. Now I'm Paul, the leader of the Christians. And he wove this whole story and he made it so magical and he made it so powerful, right? Right out from the prison to the presence of the king. When he finished this incredible classic presentation, you got to read it sometime because it's a classic. When he finished it, here's what the king said. He did send him back to prison, but here's what he said. You've almost persuaded me to be a Christian, the king. You can get so good at this, you can almost get the king. But that was that passion that he had. And here's what he said in the closing of his speech. Oh, king, I wish you had what I got, except for these chains. I don't wish the chains on you, but the change, not the chains. So classic presentation, fueled with the fire of a passionate belief. But it doesn't have to be religion now. It can be any experience or a collection of experiences that furnishes for you the fuel that, that puts that sparkle in your eye every day. It gives you this zest and appetite for life to where you can't wait to get up in the morning and you're reluctant to close your eyes at night. Wow, that kind of fire. It's very powerful. Find it. Put it together. Our next subject under communication is how to make a presentation. And whether it's a presentation to a child or a presentation to a business client or a sales presentation or whatever kind of presentation, we're all making presentations all day long, every day, business, social, personal, whatever. I have four parts to the presentation for you to uh, consider. Here's the first one, identification. One of the most important parts of the presentation process is identification. Identification is, for a new person that you haven't met before, it's getting acquainted, it's breaking the ice, it's building a bridge between you and someone else, establishing contact, uh, getting somebody's attention, so it's a very important part of the presentation process. Sometimes those first few seconds, sometimes that first minute is just so important to establishing rapport, establishing contact. Somebody once said, you never have a second chance to make a first impression. So sometimes how those opening seconds go is very important. But that's identification, getting acquainted. Some people find this easy. Some people find it more difficult. What we're doing is, you know, pointing it out so that you can start working on it deliberately instead of haphazardly or instead of just letting it go, wondering why things aren't going well. We just pick it as a part of the presentation so you can go to work on it, identification. In identifying with someone, one of the best ways is to pick something you have in common to get the conversation started with. Somebody mentioned during the break they attended this leadership seminar up at the ranch. Uh, what, you were up there three or four years ago. And everybody got acquainted up there real easy. And the reason is because when you met somebody new, you would say, hi, how are you? Did you get as lost as I did trying to find this place? <laughs> And it just, everybody says, yeah, I got lost too. And that immediately starts this, you know, little more friendly process of getting acquainted simply because you had a recent experience that uh, you could talk about. So identification is trying to find something you have in common with someone else. You want something that makes you real, something that makes you uh, a person that someone would desire to talk to.
in the identification process, we use this little mental phrase. We want somebody to say, me too. Say, well, here's what happened to me. Somebody says, well, me too. I got lost. They say, well, me too. Here's how I felt. Someone says, I understand how that feels. Me too. Here's a reaction you don't want. The reaction called, so what? Now, usually one of the problems in people's trying to identify is they try to impress versus express. Mr. Schoff gave me a little counsel on this. Don't try to impress, he said. Rather, learn to express. Express will get you more me too's. Impressing will get you more so what's. See, so what puts up the barrier instead of building a bridge. It blocks this flow of communication. Usually when we introduce somebody, the introduction is usually full of so what's. One of the biggest challenges I have in doing seminars is to overcome my introduction. Usually an introduction, you know, you have to give your list of credits. But when somebody gets through with the, he's president of this and vice president of this, and he's got several companies, corporations, does business around the world, those are pretty well so what's. And I guess we, you know, we consider it sort of standard, the so what's. So one of the first things I do when I come up on the platform, and you know, I get the polite applause, and I understand it's polite applause. It's just part of the routine, right, that we go through. If you take that serious, you're in trouble. But you know, you get the polite applause. So I walk up after all these credits, right? And I can tell the people are, you know, saying, you know, you know, who is this guy? And is he really all he's cracked up to be, right? You can just feel all this going on in the audience. So I usually try to just, you know, break that down just as quickly as I can by saying something like, uh, I appreciate the warm welcome. Did you hear what the cow said to the farmer on a cold winter morning? Right, thanks for the warm hand, right? And it goes over about like it did here, right? I mean, it just sort of, you know, <laughs> hangs out there. And that's to kind of let people know that, you know, we're not interested in the chairman title or the president's title. We're here to just, you know, talk person to person. Part of that is just an attempt to identify, to let everybody know you're not up there to talk down at them. You're not there to try to impress them with your success or anything else. We're there to really share ideas. But that's always a challenge. And every person and every audience is a brand new challenge. Every time you talk with somebody, it's a brand new challenge to identify. Now here's what you must, must do with someone who you already know, re-identify. You don't get this identification process once when you get to know somebody and then it's, it's forever over. You must constantly re-identify. No matter how long you've known somebody, they still wanna know how, what are you feeling and what's going on with you and what are you thinking and Right? Everybody wants to know that, even if we've been around somebody for a long time, when you meet somebody. That's why we use those expressions. If we've known somebody for years, if we see them again, we say, how are you and how are you doing? That's to get this thing going, this identification process going between us and someone else. Now, in the identification process, make sure if you tell little stories about yourself in identifying, make sure that they're accurate stories. Part of my identification I sprinkle throughout the whole evening seminar. My little story about uh, meeting the little Girl Scout, selling me Girl Scout cookies, right? That's just a little story to try to keep identifying with my audience, to keep them on my side, right? That's, that's identification story, right? She gives me this unique presentation, asked me if I want to buy and I wanted to, but I didn't have $2. Now see, I can almost hear everybody out in the audience say, well, I know what that's like. I've been caught without any money. I know how embarrassing that is. See, that's an identification story. Somebody says, I know how that feels. And I say, to this day, I can remember the pain. Somebody says, I've had some of that pain too. I know what that's like. All of that is identification, identification. So you have to re-identify if you're talking with somebody over any length of time, you just re-identify little stories, things that's happened to you. So go back over your life and pick out the things that will identify with people. 
Now you've got the challenge of also identifying with a variety of people from different backgrounds and different uh, businesses than your own. And you just learn to do that, different age groups. Part of it is just being more aware of what's going on in the world so that you can just intelligently talk about some things with people from almost any walk of life. Okay. Jesus, the master teacher, was probably one of the great identifiers of all time. He had this incredible knack of talking to somebody with language that they understood what he was saying. One day he said to those around him, today I'm gonna to teach you how to fish. Guess who he was talking to? A bunch of fishermen. He said, gentlemen, today we're gonna to have some lessons on how to fish. Only I don't want to teach you how to fish for fish because you already know how to do that. What I want to do is to teach you how to fish for people. Now see, he couldn't have chosen a better identification. He didn't say, I'm gonna teach you how to recruit. I mean, what do they know from recruiting? <laughs> no, no. He said, I'm gonna teach you how to fish. Now, when you're talking to fishermen, that's clever, right? You don't say recruit when you're talking to fishermen. You say fish. See, that's incredible. You just learn when you talk to fishermen, talk a little fish talk, right? If you talk to lawyers, just talk a little lawyer talk. I mean, you just learn how, right? Go sit in the courtroom and, you know, learn a little lawyer talk if you're going to talk to lawyers or get in trouble <laughs> and uh, <laughs> go to court, right? And sit on the witness stand and whatever. Just so that you can learn to identify. See, I've been through it. I know it. And uh, analyze who you're talking to and see if you can't pick out certain ways to identify. Now, of course, there's some stories that are common to us all. And sometimes it doesn't take much of a story to identify. Here's a good one. How to identify with kids. Let me give you some keys. First, read all their books. One of the best ways to identify with kids is read all their books. If you've got a 12-year-old, you just read all their books so that you know them forwards and backwards. So you can use those books as a means of identification and stories. Say, remember that story, when, when, when? Kid says, did you read that book? I read them all. I know all those stories. And remember when, and you can use a thousand illustrations from those books that you've read to get a point across, to get something across. It's a means of identification. Read their books. Then when you get ready to talk, you've got something in common. They've read the book, you've read the book. And it's loaded probably with illustrations and points and ideas and, and human life stories of disappointment and, and success and failure, all of that. The way to identify is find out what someone else is interested in, find out who they are, how old they are, what they do, what's going on, and see if in your reservoir of experience and awareness you can't find something that will identify and cause this person to say, me too, I understand that, and you've got them coming your way. Then also a way to identify with kids is to remember when you were a kid. See, I don't have any problem talking to 12-year-olds because I remember every day about being 12. I remember all those experiences in detail. The highs, the lows, the exciting times, the desperate times. When I thought the world was coming to an end and when I was riding on top, I remember all those feelings at 12. Did you ever get chosen last? <laughs> that ever happened to you? They're choosing up sides, right? So I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, and you're standing like this. <laughs> See, all you got to do is go back over, go back over, search around in your life. You can find a thousand ways to identify with all kinds of people from your own life experience. Okay. You don't have to go anywhere else except to your own life to come up with all kinds of ways to identify with anybody. But here's what you got to do. You got to do it consciously, consciously, deliberately. What can I pick? What can I think of that will help this conversation that will get my idea across? Who am I talking to? Oh yes, here's what I'll use, right? Your mind just 
like a computer starts picking up all these things. This is why it's so important to keep a journal. And when you think of a life experience and say, oh, I could use that life experience in a, in a variety of ways. You put that life experience in your journal, you go over it, you, you think about it. Then when you get ready to talk, it's instant recall. You'll, you, you'll remember it. And you can't believe what you can do with people from all walks of life, business, social, personal. If you will learn the identification process, do it deliberately. Pick out things that you have in common, feelings you have in common with everybody. Okay? Identification. And then pick up stories from all kinds of life situations that are similar to yours. Somebody had a feeling of disappointment. You say, I know what that's like, but I'm going to use that story to illustrate disappointment. Just be aware, the movies you attend and the books you read and the stories you hear, be a gatherer of life's experiences so that you can use them all for points of reference and points of identification. When a teenager watches the movie Gone with the Wind, they see one kind of movie. When you're in your 20s and 30s and you see Gone with the Wind, you see a different kind of movie, right? When you get along into your 40s, 50s, sure enough, it's a different kind of movie because now you're reading between the lines. Now you're sensing what the real tragedy was, what the complications of life were. It's altogether different at 40 than it is at 14. Same movie, only now you're seeing it. You're picking up all the different parts of the story and the feelings of the story. It's getting to you. But that's part of the identification process. Just be more aware of what you see and what you read and what's happening to you so that you say, oh, there's something I could use. There's something I could use. I'll use that. The next time I talk to people like this, I'll tell them this. I'll tell them this. I'll use this story. That's part of the identification process, building this bridge.